morning and welcome to uh, St. Michael's Episcopal Church here in O'Fallon. Uh, we hope that you are weathering the heat, <laughs> but it's uh, it's better than some other things that we could have. Let's begin our worship this morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. O God, protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Genesis. Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give you to her than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my, name is my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, and Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11 and 45. We will read it responsibly, responsibly by full verse. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing, sing to him, him. sing, sing praises, praises to him, him. And, and speak, speak of, of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments prevail in all the world. He has also been mindful of his covenant. The, the promise, promise he made, he made for a thousand, thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath that he swore to Isaac, which he established as a statute for Jacob, an everlasting covenant for Israel, saying, To you will I give the land of Canaan to be your allotted inheritance. Alleluia. A reading from the, the letter of Paul to the Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, and that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to the purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about those things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God elect? It is God who justifies, who is condemned. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor death, nor <clears throat> anything else that in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in, it, in its branches. He told them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Christ is in our midst. He is now and ever shall be. Amen. You may notice I'm uh, touting a little more bulk this morning than normal. I'm, I'm wearing a back brace to try and deal with my sciatica. So um, if I look a little awkward, that's why. There's a, a well-known story about the time that Ann Sullivan was trying to teach Helen Keller. The words that she was learning by sign language were not just a game of some kind, but that the signs meant something, something concrete, that they were names of real things in real life. Up to that point, Helen, who had been deaf and blind from the age of 19 months, after a case of what we believe may have been meningitis, had only vague notions of the nature of the world around her, and she did not come to know how to understand or relate to it easily. The breakthrough that finally made Helen eager to know what everything was and what its name was, was when Ann Sullivan tried to teach Helen the word for water. Suddenly, Ann got the idea to take Helen out to the pump in the yard and to pump water over one of Helen's hands while she made the signs for the word water in the other, over and over again in Helen's other hand. Slowly, Helen made the connection as she experienced both the thing and its meaning at the same time. And from that point on, there was no stopping her learning. How would you describe wind to a person who had lived indoors? How would you say orange is different from green to someone who's colorblind? How would you describe friendship or love to a person who had been left alone from birth? And would they believe you? I ask these things not only because translating our experience of God to others is often a challenge, but because I think we should understand that Jesus himself faces quite a dilemma in today's gospel reading as he looks at his crowd. Imagine trying to describe, to get others to imagine what the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like. How would you relate the kingdom of heaven to things that people know? But at the same time, make them realize that it's different, that it's far more that it is in most ways indescribable, especially that it is perfect and good, which are qualities hard to find in this life, and that because it is perfect and good, some of the things that we love in this life will be turned on their heads, left alone as unacceptable or transformed and restored. The kingdom of heaven is kind of like a place, a state of being, 
a final realization of perfect human desire in all things, and it does not disappoint. Human beings place a high value on knowing things. But actually knowing something is a tricky business. You can know a lot about something without knowing the thing itself. Catholic priest and liturgical scholar Aidan Kavanaugh used to tell his graduate students, don't think that just because you know a lot about church history or the gospel stories and you can quote scripture and you know most of the ways Christians worship can be performed and you can teach its meaning to members of the church, don't think that that makes you a Christian. Christianity is not the same as cognitive understanding of facts and concepts that fall into the category of Christian. It's one thing to know about Jesus and the effects that his life has had on the world, but it's quite another thing to know Jesus himself. To actually follow him. To know that he is here and to be affected through and through by his transforming power and love every day. Let's look at today's gospel story, and please remember that it's following right on the heels of the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the weeds that we looked at last week and the week before. You can almost hear people in the crowd mumbling amongst themselves with some shouting out here and there, Tell us some more! Tell us more about the kingdom of heaven! Please, keep talking! Jesus looked at the crowd around him, and it seems that even he did not know what to say. Remember, Jesus, as the Christ, has experienced the kingdom of heaven. That is his normal. But how can he describe it to others so that they might begin to grasp what he's talking about? Well, Jesus thinks on his feet. He begins coming at the subject from different angles. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And then that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden that is stumbled upon by sheer luck. And then that it's treasure that a person seeks after. And then that it's like a net that collects everything, but not everything in the net can be saved. And finally he says, it's as if scribes trained for revealing the kingdom are masters who bring out of their treasure store both new things and old things. Well, that's a lot to take in. <laughs> and it had to be confusing as people tried to wrap their heads around it all. It's confusing for us. Have you understood all this, he asked his disciples. They answer, yes. <laughs> they lied, of course. <laughs> but yes sounds better than, huh? Here's where Jesus' parables get really interesting. These stories don't have just one meaning. Jesus' parables are going to mean different things to different people, to different listeners. And what one person hears about the kingdom of heaven may be good and revelatory and reassuring to them, whereas another person hearing the same parable may feel foreboding or impending condemnation. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is not going to be the same for everybody. For some people, it will be good news. For others, it may seem to be bad news because it's a new reality and new things we fear. Let's look at these parables one by one. First, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man casting a mustard seed. Keep in mind, mustard seeds are so tiny they can be hidden among other seeds, and you wouldn't know it. They look like dust. On the one hand, mustard is the smallest of the seeds, and it grows to be a great bush, even a tree that birds come and roost in. On the other hand, if you like mustard, like I do, it seems pretty cool and miraculous that so tiny a seed can produce such a large bush. But to say that these plants are trees is pushing it a bit. Any bird larger than a wren is going to bend a mustard bush over and be forced to fly away. 
Of course, I have not experienced every species of mustard that there is. And many, many stories and visions and prophecies in the history of Israel, nations are depicted as trees. Trees that sprout and grow and that are cut down. Just down the road, 40 miles from where Jesus is preaching this day, are surviving cedars of Lebanon. These are giant redwoods like those in California. So calling a mustard plant a tree must mean something else. What was mustard? Well, we can't really say it's a valuable spice, although I like it on my hot dogs, because there are more than 100 different kinds and it grows by accident or opportunity all over the place. It's seldom, if ever, planted on purpose. Mustard is a weed. So there could be another meaning lurking in there behind the simple coolness of a tiny seed becoming something great. That tiny seed has landed in a field dedicated to another crop. The mustard has invaded that field and prospered in spite of the will of the field's owner. Consider this. The mustard, the kingdom of heaven, has invaded the kingdom of this world and is starting to take over. In spite of its tiny and seemingly insignificant beginnings. And it will become a great tree, a great nation or kingdom that will eventually dominate the field in which it has landed to grow. And the owner of this field that we live in doesn't like that. Then Jesus throws out another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman hides in three measures of grain, presumably wheat. The three measures of wheat amounts to about 30 pounds. That's a lot of wheat. Now we're not talking about powdered yeast, a quarter of a teaspoon of powder in a little paper packet that you keep in your refrigerator. No, there were no refrigerators in ancient Palestine, and there were no paper packets. (laughs) If you have ever maintained a live, active yeast culture in a bread mixture for making sourdough or Amish friendship bread or the like, you know what we're talking about here. In the ancient world, yeast had to be maintained in continuously growing cultures that were blobs of ripe-smelling, runny dough. And some had to be kept back from every batch of bread in order to grow a culture for the next day's batch of bread. Here again, it seems we have a mixed message of sorts. The woman, quote-unquote, hides the yeast in the grain to make lots of bread. That's great on the surface. She probably made about 100 loaves from that much flour. And the yeast, much like the mustard seed, is a tiny, tiny thing that affects moist flour in such a way as to make lots and lots of good bread, which is a positive thing. But remember, at the same time, Jesus is always teaching his followers to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. A little bit of yeast grows to transform the grain or dough into which it has been introduced, whether it's good or bad. In Jewish Passover celebrations, the tradition of a Seder meal calls for yeast to be hidden somewhere in the house, and the child has to find it and rid the house of its unclean influence before the feast can begin. How does the child find the yeast? Well, because it's a culture. It smells. It may be in a jar with a lid, but it's ripe, and you can smell it. There's no Tupperware, no fridge. So in these first two parables, depending on who you are, it might be great to be a mustard seed or to be yeast because you're part of a great thing, something that will become great, an amazing thing even, Something that starts small, humbly at first, in secret, or at least hidden. But if it is ordained by God, it will expand and multiply and thrive. Or the story might reveal to you that you're going to end up on the wrong side of things. The key lies in how things come to an end because of what they are, not 
and because of how they begin. Followers of Christ begin a journey that's already complete, and we fight a battle that's already been won. It seems strange to us, but that's the way it works. Now we hear Jesus telling two more parables that are unlike the former, but that are very similar to one another. The main character in these parables seems to be people who are believers already, because at least one of them knows what to look for, and they both know what they have found when they find it. These parables also offer two points of view about what the kingdom of heaven is like. Both clearly say that it is a treasure of great value. In the first, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. It's not out in the open, plain for all to see. The one who finds it wants to possess that field so that one sells all that they have in order to own the field in which the treasure lies. Who knows what else might be hidden in that field? But the field is not the point. It's the value of the treasure. Presumably the one who finds this treasure, because it is hidden, is able to buy that field very reasonably, because nobody else knows that it's there. And they consider themselves to be wealthy once they have it. The second treasure-related parable speaks of the kingdom as a beautiful and costly pearl that a merchant is actually looking for. So here the importance of the search enters into our meaning. In both of these brief stories, the kingdom of heaven is depicted as something rare, hard to find, so valuable that when it is found, the finder knows that it's worth it for a person to sell everything that they have in order to possess it. From these two stories, it seems that a person can either stumble into the kingdom because she's wandering around the right field, or a person can expend a lot of effort diligently seeking the kingdom, in which case, eventually, they will find it. But either way, once the kingdom, the treasure, is found, it's worth one's entire life to keep. At this point, it seems Jesus might still be seeing some confused squints in the crowd. <laughs> so he appeals to the fishermen and those listening. He says, the kingdom of heaven is also like a net that scoops up all the fish indiscriminately, but that after they are caught, angels will come and pick out the bad ones. This parable is a lot like last week's parable of the wheat and the weeds. All the fish are swimming in the same water, but neither the fish nor the fishermen are capable of discerning which should be caught and which should not. All must swim together until a power with greater discernment and with a vision to the purposes held in store for those fish makes a choice. Finally, and yet one more analogy, Jesus depicts scribes. Today we might say clergy, but it could be anyone who manages a storehouse of some kind, as those who serve the kingdom by reaching into a treasury and bringing out both things that are old and things that are new and making these treasures available to everyone so that we might stumble upon them or seek to understand them more deeply and discover their value. I think the point here is not that some treasures are old and some are new, and we're talking about nuggets of wisdom and insight from Scripture here, because all the treasures are from the same treasury. But the point is that the scribe or the cleric, the preacher, must point out to the passers-by Look, this is a treasure. This word is precious. Figure out a way to keep it for yourself and cling to it with all your life. Old scriptures, more recent scriptures, all must be seen and heard and understood to apply to us today. As well as they were two or three or four thousand years ago, they were relevant then, they're relevant now. But we have to be pointed out, or we have to point out how that works. We who are called to make the kingdom present today. We who are miners of the word, to use an analogy, 
And all of us are miners, gold miners, silver miners, diamond miners, not just clergy. All of us are called to dig and to bring hidden nuggets to the surface and say, look what I found. So that those who don't recognize treasure in the rough or who don't care for digging might come to appreciate the life-changing value of what can be found in the mine. Jesus was not a big fan of the status quo. He liked to point out that we can focus on the worlds and the systems around us, assuming that these systems are stable, unmovable, and all that exists, or all that is important. But if we do, we're just being lazy. We're not living out our calling. We miss out on the treasure God has buried almost invisibly in our midst. We can gain the hollow shell of the world and lose the substance of our souls. Many of us have already forgotten about how life was different two or three years ago. But if the COVID-19 crisis has taught us nothing else, it should have driven home that for us something tiny and invisible can grow rapidly and unexpectedly to be the main thing that we have to deal with in order to survive. For good or for evil. Jesus urges us to be single-minded about seeking and owning the kingdom of God. As hidden and intangible as it may seem to many of us. Someday it will be everything. It will be all in all. Right now, as long as it's been around in some places and some hearts, it's still struggling to take root in small invisible ways in other places so that it can infect and take over the kingdom of darkness that still controls most of this world. I would urge each of you to take some time and sit down, fire up your imaginations, and in your prayer time, try to write a parable for yourself. Maybe you could write a series of parables. The kingdom of heaven is like what? Doing that may help you see how the reign of God is taking hold or how it can take hold in your own life in small and unexpected ways. And maybe give you words to share that idea with others. Maybe it's taking over in scandalous ways but tiny ways. And it will do that until it is for you all in all. And you are more than willing to give up everything in order to possess it. Now let us stand and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look, look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people for today are Form 4 of the Book of Common Prayer beginning on page 388. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide our president and all who serve, the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Alex. Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Adam, Jared, Joe, Cervella, Linda, Eric, Ellen, Kyla, Doug, Beth, Jesse, Devin, Jason and Jennifer, June, Jennifer, Bill, Philip, David, Caden, Janet, Bob, Nancy, Steve, Zach, Tony, Crystal, Thomas, Michael, Susan, and Rochelle, Hayden Loudon and the Loudon family, Ellie Urban and the Urban family, Rayburn family, Betsy Cundiff and the Cundiff family, and members of our military on active duty, and people around the world displaced by war and natural disasters. Are there others? Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. I ask you thanksgiving for those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Jim. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We commend to your mercy all those who have died, especially Diane, Andrea, and Janet, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Michael, and all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. 
that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself a perfect offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light 
and light. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. When we had become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for us the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your heart minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Announcements. Do we have any announcements this morning? Yes, Narnie. Anybody else? Well, we've got a number of things coming up in August, but uh, I don't think we need to really talk about them now. There's a youth uh, gathering on the 20th. Um, on the 19th, right before that, there is a Curcio reunion here on that Saturday, and Canon Evans will be uh, officiating at that uh, gathering. But uh, aside from those two things, I think we just have to endure the heat and do our best. <laughs> yes, Ann. I want to thank everyone that has brought school supplies for the Feed My Lambs group. Mm -hmm. If you didn't remember to bring them this morning uh, and still would like to donate to the Feed My Lambs program, if you would take them to the Y. The reason I say that is they've informed me that they're packing the backpack Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So if you bring them here, I'll check on Wednesday to see if there's anything here because they'll continue to fill them. But the majority of the packing will be the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So if you still have some you didn't bring today, um, you can take them to the Y if you know where that is down on Seven Hills Road. Seven Hills Road. Okay. Uh, you walk in the door and there's just a whole pile of them to the right. You don't need to say anything to anybody. You just go and put it in the pile. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Anything else? All right, let us uh, conclude our worship with the singing of our final hymn. <laughs> Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.